Hey guys, welcome to the Wave Crypto Club. Today we have Raghav, who is an investment analyst at Longhash Ventures. As a guest speaker, Raghav will be telling us some interesting facts about you know what are the interesting problems that the Web3 world is solving today, and are there any interesting cryptos that we are supposed to be looking at? So welcome, Raghav. Thank you so much, Arjun. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks for that. So what do you think is happening so, in the Web3 world? Quickly giving quick intro about myself. Uh, and yeah, go on. Sorry, yeah. So um, I'm Raghav and I'm currently working with Longash Ventures and uh, Longash is a Web3 investment fund and accelerator program. So we have an investment fund where we invest in uh, Web3 startups and we also have an accelerator program where we partner with the likes of Polkadot, Filecoin, Algorand to help early stage Web3 startups understand the technology better and scale them, help them raise money and connect them to the uh, experts in the industry. So that's a very brief intro about Longash. And uh, yeah, happy to be here and uh, answer all the questions that you have. That's great. So I will link the uh, website of Longhash in the description. If you guys are interested, then you, you can go and check it out. Uh, you know, the link is in the description. So Raghav, what do you think is happening in the Web3 world? You're so closely associated with it. Um, what do you see on a daily basis? What are people solving? Right. So I think given that Web3 is a, such a big word, it's very difficult to condense that answer. But I think there are two big challenges which I see right now. And I think those are going to be really interesting. One is the problem of a very good uh, user interface, I would say. Mm -hmm. So right now, although the blockchain technology has enabled a lot of use cases and there's a lot of value, but for a wider adoption, I think those technological aspects needs to be abstracted away from the users because users are actually in the end interested in the use case mm -hmm. and not so much in on how the technology is working or where the data is flowing, where the asset is being routed. So as we are seeing emergence of a multi-chain world where you have Ethereum ecosystem, where you also have Polkadot, you have Cosmos, and then you have a lot of other layer ones also building, I think there's a lot of fragmented liquidity Mm -hmm. And applications and developers are trying to bring that liquidity together. However, there are solutions like bridges, like you can send your tokens from Ethereum to Polkadot or to any other ecosystem or any other layer one. But that, that particular aspect is a little challenging for a regular user. Mm -hmm. So there, there needs to be a lot of uh, well-built interoperability solutions which should ideally work behind the scenes. The users are not at all concerned with how interoperability is working. If we are right now talking on Zoom, we are not concerned how is Zoom routing the data, which are the servers being used, which mm -hmm. technology is being used at the end. We are mostly interested in being able to talk through, right? Similarly, when I say interoperability, that needs to be abstracted away from the user. And then the user needs to have a very simple interface with which he or she can interact and get the real value. Mm -hmm. So I think two interesting problems to be solved one is how do you interoperate among all the different blockchain solutions which are out there so mm -hmm. many layer ones and layer twos, roll up solutions being built out there so how do you how do you link all of those together and once you have figured out the solution to bring everything together then how do you present a very simple interface to the user so that he or she can interact with a lot of ease without worrying about the technical uh, you know complexities of the entire solution mm. i see and what do you think is a great crypto in this space or is there a crypto that you have researched in depth that you can speak about walk us through what they're up to so the users can get an idea of you know how the uh, a web3 startup is trying to solve this problem of interoperability yes i think in terms of interoperability again interoperability is a very big space uh, you know you could be talking about bridges you could be talking about layer 2 scaling solutions or you could be talking about general message passing and uh, I, I think we, I've spent some time in the past researching about the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, and and when, when we are talking about the interoperability of Cosmos, which we will be discussing today, it, it will mostly discuss about interoperability within the Cosmos ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But there are solutions which are working on bringing interoperability between Cosmos and Ethereum based or EVM compatible layer ones, as well as to, you know, from Cosmos to private blockchains. Mm -hmm. So the use cases are emerging. 
Uh, but yes, I think Cosmos is one interesting ecosystem to be looked at. And the reason I, I, I was hoping to discuss this with you is that if you look at Ethereum or any other EVM based solutions, those have got fairly good uh, marketing behind them. Mm -hmm. Like they have been able to market them to a lot of users. But I think in that regards, Cosmos has not gained that level of traction. The mm -hmm. marketing focus has been very less, but mm -hmm. the development focus has been very high. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of interesting things going on in this ecosystem, which the users should ideally be looking at and with which they could, you know, see the next big thing coming out. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very, uh, like our thesis at Longhash is we believe in a multi-chain universe where we believe there are the, it's not going to be that Ethereum or Polkadot or one ecosystem is going to dominate. Slowly mm -hmm. and gradually, uh, each one of the layer ones will find its own niche and own use cases and each of them will exist. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's just a matter of how they will coexist, mm -hmm. right? right? And Cosmos ecosystem is just one part of that entire universe which is going to exist in the future, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be different from, let's say, what we saw with an Android and an iOS and Microsoft OS. Or, you know, if we had a, a ton of mobile OSs, but eventually only Android and iOS sort of stayed on. But you're saying in the right. blockchain space, that's not going to be the case. It, we are going to live with multi-chain. So we have to, right. uh, you know, interoperability becomes an important use case here. Right. I think that, at least in my personal opinion, that is definitely going to be the case. Because if you look at, like, Vitalik came up very famously with the trilemma of blockchains, like scalability trilemma, where he said that you could only pick two out of the three, which is scalability, security, and decentralization. Now, it's not just black and white that you choose, I choose these two out of three. Mm -hmm. Like there is diff degree to which you are achieving. Like mm -hmm. one blockchain, one could say we are very much focused on decentralization. But then how are you defining decentralization? Is it just based on the number of validators mm -hmm. or is it also based on, you know, there might be a huge number of validators, but the top five have almost 80% of the authority. Right. So it, it's not a black and white uh, chessboard where you could simply pick any two factors and then say, okay, this is my focus area. I think each <clears throat> layer one or any blockchain technology brings its own advantages and disadvantages. And because of its own inherent advantages and disadvantages, I think there are going to be use cases which are more suitable for a few blockchains and other use cases which might be more suitable for others, mm -hmm. right? So given that every blockchain has to offer something different, there are going to be use cases which might be suitable for each different one of them. And hence, I think there's going to be a multi-chain universe. Right. And and how is Cosmos doing it? How What is Cosmos doing special in this or how are they trying to solve this? Sure. So <clears throat> if I go back down the history lane a little bit, I think the most important takeaway from the original Bitcoin paper, which was published in 2009, was the concept of decentralization, mm -hmm. that you could transfer value from one person to another without any trusted intermediary or without any central authority. Right? Right. So decentralization came as a very important aspect out of it. But the use cases were limited, right? You could only send tokens of values from one place to another place. Then came Ethereum with the capability of smart contracts mm -hmm. that can create and build smart contracts on top of that blockchain, which will allow you to explore much more use cases, which we have seen with the emergence of DeFi, gaming, NFT, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and a plethora of use cases are coming up. <clears throat> Although Ethereum and uh, like Ethereum and DeFi gained a lot of traction in the summer of 2020, the work on the Cosmos actually started way back in 2014. So I, I think in terms of origination, I think Ethereum and Cosmos are two of the oldest ones which have been working in this space right now. Mm -hmm. And how it started was in 2014, uh, Jay Kwan and Ethan from Tendermint organization, they were focusing on a Byzantine fault tolerance consensus algorithm. And then they refined their idea further and by 2000, they worked in 2015 for conceptualizing it and by 2016 they presented the vision of Cosmos. So <clears throat> let me first quickly go through what the vision of Cosmos is. So Cosmos says that their vision is a network of blockchains which is mm -hmm. able to communicate with each other in a decentralized way. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> as you can see the problem, one of the most pressing problems with Ethereum was scalability issues. The network utilization reached very high, the gas fees went very high. Mm -hmm. And 
to this problem, a lot of people had different different responses, right? Ethereum focused towards a roll up centric future where, where they said that decentralization and security will be taken care of by Ethereum layer one. And the scalability part will be solved by the roll-up solutions or the layer two which are being built on top of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there were application-specific chains or side chains coming up, like Polygon came into the picture, right, as a side chain. Mm -hmm. And then you have other layer ones coming like Algorand or Avalanche, right? Mm -hmm. But Cosmos came up with a vision that instead of, you know, having different siloed layer ones, let us build a universe of layer one blockchains mm -hmm. now the biggest issue with building a universe of separate layer ones is that how do you make them you know talk to each other mm -hmm. right because because at the end of the day if everything is fragmented then it's not a really good solution so uh, cosmos came up with a vision that we will allow any developer to build their own blockchain build their own layer one mm -hmm. and then building a own layer one is a very challenging task like you need to worry about what is going to be the consensus algorithm how you're going to uh, incentivize the validators and there are a lot of aspects which will go behind building a layer one which mm -hmm. is not at all an easy task like it's a nightmare and it requires a lot of resources especially from monetary point of view as well as from technical resources point of view so what cosmos did was cosmos said that in order to build a layer one you basically need three parts one mm -hmm. is the networking layer mm -hmm. the other is the consensus layer and the third is the application layer and they said that the consensus and networking will be provided to developers as a pre-packaged solution, mm -hmm. which we will take. You focus on building the application layer, mm -hmm. right? So how they're defining consensus is basically nodes are agreeing together on a current state of system. Now mm -hmm. this consensus could be proof of work, proof of stake. There are multiple solutions out there. And mm -hmm. even in those, there are like different ways to reach consensus. And then networking is propagation of transactions or the messages, right? So they said that developers don't need to worry about the consensus on networking as long as it's good, mm -hmm. right? Because when you're building the application, you don't have to worry about building the base infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And then the application is something which the developers will have to build themselves, but Cosmos is providing them with a host of tools which will help you build the application, mm -hmm. right? And how this application is connected to the consensus layer and the networking layer is through what they call as ABCI, mm -hmm. right? So ABCI is the application blockchain interface, which allows to connect the application layer to the consensus layer. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing about ABCI is that it can be wrapped in any programming language. Mm -hmm. So while on Ethereum, you are focusing mainly on Viper or Solidity mainly to write smart contracts, in this case, you could write your application in any language mm -hmm. and then wrap it through the application blockchain interface and leverage the consensus and networking layer, right? So I'm not going to talk in a lot of detail about the consensus and the networking layer. However, uh, on quick notes, they're using Byzantine fault tolerance consensus algorithm. The details can be read by the users themselves mm -hmm. if they really want to go deep in the technology. But the good thing is that, first of all, it offers instant finality. So, <clears throat> because there's instant finality, forks cannot, forks cannot be created, right? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> that's a good thing for them. And then they can also support a lot of uh, transactions, right? Mm -hmm. So, scalability is not an issue. Now, it's not just that because of the algorithm, scalability is not an issue. The scalability is not an issue because you are building your own blockchain. Mm -hmm. I am building my own blockchain. So, instead of just vertically scaling, you are horizontally scaling because you can create multiple layer ones, mm -hmm. right? You can in fact design a layer one which is let's say very very uh, you know customized only for DeFi applications mm -hmm. and then other developers can build on top of your layer one okay so in a nutshell what i'm trying to say is cosmos is providing the entire infrastructure and tools which enable you to create your own application specific layer one mm -hmm. So, uh, referring to this website called Map of Zones, which is currently showing 49 zones in total and 48 active zones. So, mm -hmm. whatever you see here, right, these are all zones. And when we say zone, it means it's connected through IBC. I will talk about IBC in a bit. So, all, everything that you're seeing on the screen right now, these are all layer ones, which are built on the Cosmos SDK. Mm -hmm. Like, they are leveraging the networking and consensus of the Cosmos, and they've built their own application layer applications building on top of them. For mm -hmm. example, Uniswap was built on top of Ethereum, right? Yeah. Now it is a level of arbitrum optimism and a, uh, polygon as well. 
But similarly, you could come in and build your own layer one on top of it. And what it is doing is because it's a network of layer ones, everyone is not competing for the same resources, mm -hmm. which was the challenge in Ethereum before layer two came into picture, that everyone were competing for the same resources. And hence the gas price was going up. Mm -hmm. Now everyone, <clears throat> there are multiple layer ones. So the competition for those resources has gone down. Hello? Raghu, can you hear me? Hi, Arjun. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. The screen froze. Give me one sorry second. Sorry about that. Yeah, my, my, I had to change my network connection. Huh. Sorry about that. So, as I was saying that because you can build multiple layer ones, the problem of scalability is solved to a larger extent. Mm -hmm. Now, next part of the problem is now that you have built a network of blockchains, how do you make them communicate with each other? Because mm -hmm. That's the real crux of the problem because anyone could build, could theoretically build their application specific layer one, mm -hmm. despite like, ignoring the amount of effort required in building the layer one, but still interoperability is an issue. So Cosmos itself came up with a framework of IVC, which is the inter blockchain communication, mm -hmm. right? So that is a framework which can be easily leveraged by any of the layer ones, which is built on the Cosmos ecosystem. They can leverage the IVC, right? And IBC is a general message passing system mm -hmm. which will allow you to pass message from chain A to chain B. Now the use cases could be passing of tokens simply mm -hmm. or the use case could be calling a smart contract on chain A which is the, the smart, uh, I mean calling a smart contract on chain A which is available on chain B. Like mm -hmm. you're on chain A but you're calling a smart contract or invoking a call to smart contract on chain B. Mm -hmm. So IBC is a general passing framework which allows all these chains to interoperate, mm -hmm. right? So in this diagram, when you see all these connections, right? For example, if I go to SIF chain and mm -hmm. you say these lines connected, it means that SIF chain has established the IBC connections with all of the ones which are highlighted. Like mm -hmm. SIF chain is connected to Terra or Akash or IXO. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if to Cosmos, it is connected to almost all of the zones, right? Osmosis is another one which is connected to most of them. Mm -hmm. but all of them might not be, right? Kronos is, for example, connected to only five of them. Mm -hmm. So IBC is what is connecting all of them together. So at the end of the day, the vision of the Cosmos was to create an internet of blockchains. And mm -hmm. that is what they have done, that mm -hmm. they have enabled developers to build their own application specific layer one mm -hmm. and can interoperate with each other using IBC. Mm -hmm. Although Cosmos does not directly provide a solution for connecting to other ecosystem, but XLR, which you see here, is a interoperability solution, which is connecting uh, the Cosmos ecosystem to the EVM ecosystem as well. Mm -hmm. Like XLR can connect all these zones to the Ethereum main chain as well. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there's a called Gravity Bridge, which can actually transfer tokens from Ethereum to <clears throat> the world of uh, Cosmos, mm -hmm. right? That, that's the basic architecture of Cosmos that, uh, so you might have heard that DYDX recently announced that they are moving away from Starkware's technology from Starknet and building their own application specific chain yep. because it felt that the transaction per speed or the scalability that they required was mm -hmm. not being installed by a latent solution. They needed to build their own application specific chain. Mm -hmm. One of the most important aspects which I missed, I think, so far was the security of these chains. Mm -hmm. So when you're building on Ethereum, you're relying on the validators of Ethereum. You don't have to bring your own validators, yeah. right? If yeah. I want to build a decentralized application, I just write smart contracts, build the user interface, post it on Ethereum, and the security will be taken care of by Ethereum. Mm -hmm. uh, in case of Cosmos, when you're building a layer one, you actually need to have your own validators which is a very significant barrier to entry right now, mm. right? If you are an early stage project, you do not have the TVL, you do not, your token is not highly valued. How do you incentivize the validators to validate your transactions? Mm -hmm. And then it also poses a security risk. If, if your the token value is really, really small, like let's say the overall TVL on your ecosystem is just, you know, half a billion dollar, mm -hmm. then in order for validators to collude and attack, it, it's not a significant amount. On yeah. Ethereum, it's almost impractical because the amount of 
resources or the amount of money that you need in order to attack is very very high yeah so i think the most significant challenge to adoption of cosmos so far was that how do you bring your own security to the system mm-hmm. especially in the initial stages bootstrapping validators and bringing liquidity initially is very very challenging mm-hmm. but i think the it will most likely be solved with their upcoming upgrade which which they are coming up pretty soon which will come up with the concept of interchain security mm-hmm. which is very similar to what polka dot has that there's a central chain which is taking care of security so now with the upcoming interchain security what i can do is i can build my own layer one mm-hmm. let's say call it our layer one and then i don't need to bring my own validators i can outsource the security to let's say cosmos up mm-hmm. like i feel cosmos up has relatively very high valuation they have good validators so i can uh, outsource my security to cosmos up and for those validations i will have to pay a fee to the cosmos up mm-hmm. which will then be distributed among the validators as well mm-hmm. but then it obviously solves the problem of initially bringing on the validators mm-hmm. and it took over 3 years down the line i have created such a wonderful layer one that you know there are so many applications being built on top of it there's tremendous tvl on the layer on my blockchain then i could also potentially bring my own validators mm-hmm. and then use them and now this is a double edged sword right bringing your own validators because if you're bringing your own validators you're capturing a lot of value to your own token yeah so what i mean is on ethereum if you're bringing a lot of transactions the validators are earning in ethereum right mm, and yeah. the value is being accrued by the eth token yeah. not your token like your token's accrual mechanism could be different but it's definitely bringing value to the ethereum token as well mm. right because yeah. those are responsible for security <clears throat> in case of dydx i think it was a relatively straightforward call because people already know dydx mm. people already know have been using it for a long time so for them to bring their own validators is not a challenge in mm-hmm. fact it's a bonus for them because once validators are using dydx native token for validation their value accrual mechanism becomes very strong and i think uh, one of the graphs i have here drives that point really really well mm-hmm. so on the left if you look at the left chart of it and the red line i have the revenues of cosmoses which is a layer one and a decentralized exchange built in the cosmos ecosystem mm-hmm. and in the gray i have the uh, earnings of cosmos hub mm-hmm. which is the first hub or the hub which was built by the cosmos team itself mm-hmm. the uh, it, now if you look at the difference in revenues cosmos is earning like more than 200k on a given day mm-hmm. and they have like reached 500k on a given day on the other hand cosmos hub is just earning 5000 to 10000 dollars per day Oh, okay. Contrast this situation with Ethereum, where Ethereum as a layer one is earning way more than what Uniswap, which is the biggest uh, revenue generating uh, protocol in Ethereum, mm-hmm. is earning. Right. So Ethereum is actually accruing value from the transactions which are happening everywhere. Yep. Cosmos Hub is not at all accruing value from transactions that are taking place on the Cosmos Hub. Mm-hmm. Right. So. by allowing others to have their own token for validation what cosmos has done is it has let go of a accrual mechanism for their own token the atom token mm-hmm. and said if you want to build your own chain you bring your own validators then the value should be given to you not to us right so in a sense it, it it feels like a you know kind of a solution which is offering a lot more flexibility and also allowing you to earn based on what you have built mm-hmm. so i think this this graph puts into a lot of perspective how the token value accrual works mm-hmm. however it said with interchain security coming into the picture any other layer one could come and say hey i want to use cosmos hub for security and cosmos hubs token which is called the atom token it will suddenly start accruing more and more value mm-hmm. and the most important thing to note here is that i can ask any of these chains to give me uh the security it's not just cosmos hub which can provide me security if i want i can go to cosmos as well if i want mm-hmm. i could go to xlr as well mm-hmm. because may to be connected more to the ethereum ecosystem or i could go to any of them as long as they're willing to provide and they will be able to earn fees mm-hmm. so with the interchain security the cosmos hub and the atom token has the potential to increase their uh, value accrual but i think others also have that potential and uh, If you look at the most active zones by IBC volumes for the past thirty days, Cosmos and Excel are actually ahead of Cosmos Hub. Mm-hmm. So it's not like Cosmos Hub is the go 
go-to place for your interchange security needs. It could be Osmosis or XLR as well. Mm-hmm. Right. <clears throat> That's interesting. Yeah. So I think this is the basic construct of how the overall ecosystem has been developed. I can quickly go through a few numbers as well in terms mm-hmm. of what the market cap has been. So if you, um, um, and just a note here, I'm only tracking the market cap of layer one tokens, Mm -hmm. right? So I'm only tracking the uh, market cap of Osmosis zone and not the tokens of apps which are built on top of Osmosis, Mm -hmm. right? So this is only the, yeah, this is only the market cap of those 48, which we saw in the previous diagram and not the applications which are built on top of it. Mm -hmm. So it had reached all time high of close to $39 billion in late 2021. And currently as of mid August, it's close to $11 billion. Mm -hmm. So given the bear market, I don't think this number is huge, but I think it definitely has the potential to grow a lot. And, you know, it's been growing for the past three months, slowly and gradually. Mm And if you look at it, then Cosmos Hub and Kronos are the two clear big players here right now. Although Kronos is not very tightly integrated with a lot of zones. Like mm-hmm. if, if I go to Cosmos Hub, it's integrated to, let's say, Kronos. It's only connected to two or three. And it's mostly being used to connect it to the crypto.org, which mm-hmm. is their exchange as well, right? Yeah. So I think a lot of value is flowing from, you know, crypto.org to Kronos and then back. But these are the two largest ecosystems so far. Mm-hmm. And in terms of DeFi TVL also, Kronos and Osmosis are the biggest one. Mm-hmm. Now, interestingly, you won't see anything in terms of Cosmos here, right? Yeah. The Cosmos Hub. Because Cosmos Hub itself is not supporting building of applications on top of it. Mm-hmm. So Cosmos Hub has this in vision that tomorrow if there are 500 chains, instead of establishing IBC connection with each and every one of them, I will just establish a connection with Cosmos Hub and Cosmos Hub will have a connection with each of every one of them. Mm-hmm. So I don't have to set up an IBC connection with 499 other app chains. I just have to connect to Cosmos Hub, which will suddenly provide me interoperability with the entire ecosystem. So that's the vision where Cosmos Hub is headed. But as I said, it's not the only one which might be connecting, right? Osmosis or XLR or any of them could be the containers for that. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll take a quick pause here and see if, if there are any questions or anything you would want me to elaborate on in terms of the architecture. Yeah. So go, going at all this, right? Now, where exactly is the real value for for Cosmos that would eventually drive up the price of the token, right? That's mostly what you know my users or my viewers would be quite interested in because if, they, if they're gonna invest, they want to know what is it that is going to drive up value. Here, uh, uh, looking at what you just said, it makes sense for a lot of these applications that are being built on top of uh, on top of uh, Cosmos, for instance. But what right. is it that is 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 there a feature already, or is there something in the roadmap which uh, you know people have to, which investors have to sort sort of look forward to, after which the token price is going to really start shooting up. Right. So I think when you say, uh, you know, the token, it's very difficult to define a token in the Cosmos ecosystem. So as I said, one token is your Atom token, yep. which is the native token of the Cosmos hub, mm-hmm. right? So, but each and every one of them will have their own native token, mm-hmm. right? One thing that you need to, in terms of, if you're thinking about investing in any of those, you need to look at which layer one do you think is gaining the most traction and is offering a lot of value. Mm-hmm. So you could start looking at like what Cosmos is doing. Mm-hmm. And how is it gaining so much IBC transfer, which are the good applications which are being built on top of it. But at the same time, I, I did mention that there was to a certain degree limited value tool for Atom, but you also need to understand what Atom is. Mm-hmm. Atom is not simply a token which you buy at a low and then sell tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Atom is actually a staking token. Mm-hmm. So when I say staking token, what that means is the inflation, uh, there's unlimited supply of Atom. It's an inflationary token. Right? So they keep on issuing new atoms mm-hmm. and the inflation of atom falls somewhere between 7 and 20%. 7% is the minimum inflation, 20 is the highest. Mm-hmm. And how they decide on that inflation rate is based on what percentage of atom is being staked. Mm-hmm. Right? So they have a target of 66.67%, like two thirds of the atoms in circulation should be staked. Mm-hmm. If the percentage of atom which is staked or bonded goes above that percentage, if it goes above this dotted line, mm-hmm. then inflation will come down to 7%. Mm-hmm. 
But if this taking falls very, very low, it suddenly will go towards 20%. So if you're not staking, you are being penalized. Mm -hmm. How? Because the inflation is high, the uh, number of tokens in circulation increases, that puts a downward pressure on the price of the token. Mm -hmm. And hence, you're penalized by not staking it. But if you're staking it, then you will earn rewards through the inflation which is occurring. Right? Mm -hmm. So first important note is that Atom is a inflation is a staking token. You need to stake it. Mm -hmm. The second, if you're buying Atoms from a centralized exchange from let's say Coinbase or anything like that, if you're staking through a centralized exchange, you cannot earn the staking rewards. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing to keep in mind while investing in Atom would be that you transfer funds from centralized exchange into your Kepler wallet or a Cosmos Station wallet and then buy from a... I mean, you need to move your Atom from your centralized exchange to a decentralized wallet like mm -hmm. Kepler and Cosmos Station. Stake it. That's the most important thing. Then only you'll be able to actually read the rewards. Ah. And coming back to your original question that whether it's actually gaining traction or not or what is in their roadmap, I think... There are two or three very, very important things which are upcoming. One mm -hmm. we have already discussed, which is the upcoming interchain security. Yep. And with the interchain security, it will accrue more value to the Atom token. The other is interchain accounts. Mm -hmm. So that is another thing which is coming up that you can call a smart contract on another chain from another chain, right? So those interchain accounts are also coming into picture. Mm -hmm. So I think there are quite a lot of interesting things and the uh, there's a Cosmos Wars which is coming up in uh, Medi, uh, mm -hmm. in which they have been unveiling new things on their roadmap. So I think that is pretty interesting to watch, mm -hmm. to keep an eye on what is being built. But yeah, as I said, and, and just quickly talking about the point which I mentioned earlier, in this graph here, uh, I'm showing on the, the bars, the black bars are basically showing what percentage of fee is shared with the delegator. So mm -hmm. if you look at Kraken or Paradigm, Right, they're not sharing Anything. zero. They're sharing zero fees with the delegators, yeah, right? Yeah. So the number of the delegators is very low. But if you look at something like Everstake or Stakefish or SG1, they're sharing a considerable amount of percentage with the delegators, and hence their count is high. Mm -hmm. So you need to keep this in mind while buying an Atom token. Uh, I think the users can themselves pretty much look at how Atom token is performed here as plotted if you would have invested $100 in Bitcoin, Atom or Ethereum in July 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, Cosmos would have outperformed Bitcoin and Ethereum by now, but I don't think that's a fair way to say, you know, go buy Atom. Mm -hmm. I think you really need to understand the technology. <clears throat> if you believe that this ecosystem could grow and interchange security can bring in value, then yes, Atom token does have value. Mm. Wow, that's great. That's good to know. I, I think that pretty much sums up, uh, you know, a lot of information about the problem and and also how uh, Cosmos itself is trying to solve that. So that is, you know, I think that was amazing uh, information about this entire space. So thank you for that. Thank you for spending so much time telling my you you know viewers on on the Cosmos ecosystem itself, uh, and thank you for sparing your time. Uh, sure, my pleasure. Glad to be here, Jim. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, keep watching it because those are really good, and I think your user will really, your users will really benefit from all the research and the work that you're doing here. So I think I'm excited to. I was excited to be here, and time well spent. Yeah, thanks for that. We'll have you here again for more videos, uh, for you know, to talk about more cryptos, some more interesting problem statements. Uh, so till then, guys, if you like the if you like this video, then subscribe to the channel and welcome to the Wave Crypto Club. Uh, stay tuned for more such amazing videos.